Tyler, welcome to the show. So good to have you here. Can't wait to introduce you to the audience, have you share what you're up to, all the cool things. And uh, yeah, I just think it's going to be a really fun time getting to spend here with you and then having the audience get to spend time with you when they're listening to this. So first things first, Tyler, I'd love if you introduce yourself to the audience. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to, to share a conversation and just get to have some fun. But uh, yeah, I am uh, originally from Atlanta, Georgia area, born and raised Georgia boy. But today I am a country music singer, race car driver, an author and speaker. And we're out there doing a lot of different things. And they're not hobbies. They're not just side jobs. It's, it's what I do. And it might sound like a lot, but I love it. I love entertaining. I love being in front of people. And most of all, just connecting with others and, and seeing how others live their lives and just get to, to do community together. Yeah. Yeah, but I, and I can attest, I know, uh, we'll talk about how I know Tyler in a minute, but I can attest that he is a, he's a he- heck of a good musician, haven't seen you race cars, and I have seen you speak, so I can attest to two or three. Question for you, have you ever done a, a music gig and raced a car in the same day? So I haven't done an official like full band show and raced in the same day, but I did a national anthem for the event that I was racing in and then jumped into the race car and went racing. So <laughs> that's amazing. It's, it's, it's kind of a yes and no answer, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. It, it, it was interesting. And it was one of those moments where I jumped to the chance. Cause I said, Hey, like, do you guys need an anthem singer for that night? And I like, thought oh, that'd be really cool. Cause you're racing. That, that's amazing. Let's do it. So I booked it and day of, I was like, why did I agree to do this? You know, it, <laughs> so it, it, it was interesting to have, the mindset of even just for one performance, it's just not even you know, 90 seconds long prepping for that mentally while you're also kind of in the middle of thinking about how you're going to race and what's happening with the track and, and all that. But it was a learning experience. And we're actually for 2020, you know, as we roll into this year, we're looking at how we can incorporate and maybe do some racing and actually do some full band shows in the same day. So we're, we're testing the waters to see yeah. you know, how we can, you know, does it make sense to do that or is it too risky? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever pictured like Matt Ryan or Tom Brady singing the national anthem and then like running back out to get on the field. But that's that's super cool. So um, did you did you wear your racing? Uh, what's it called? I forget what the racing suit is called. Did you wear that while you were singing or did you wear normal clothes and then quickly change before the race? So I've actually done it more than once. That was, that oh, was the okay. first time. But one time I wore regular, like I was performing and then jumped into my, my race suit. and then. For another one, I actually wore the race suit while I was singing it because it just logistically, even though it only takes a few minutes to throw it on, to have to run back to the trailer, change, throw it on, it would have been a hassle. So uh, I've done it both ways. And, it, you know, I think people are confused when you're in the race suit singing because they're like, wait, he's a driver. Why is he singing? This doesn't make sense. But then they hear it and they're like, oh, okay, he actually sings. So it, it's interesting to, to see people's reaction for sure. Yeah. I love this because just to be clear for the audience, I had no idea what the answer to this question was, and it's way better than I expected, <laughs> which is which is awesome. So, um, really quickly, I want to spend a uh, sure how Tyler and I know each other. Uh, you've heard me on some of the other episodes talk about the speaking program I went through it, broke public speaking. It's amazing. Uh, Tyler and I met through that that as well. We were in the same cohort, so we got a chance to get to know each other, see each other speak, support each other through that, and we've become friends since that time. Uh, that wrapped up for us in February of this year, and we've definitely kept in touch since then, uh, you know, keeping in touch with social media. And now you're here on the podcast. I'm so glad you're taking the time to be with me and the rest of us today. So time yeah, on our tradition here. Yeah. So time on our tradition here on the show is to give each other our first impressions of what we thought of each other when we first met. And you and I haven't shared this with each other. And since it's my show, I'm going to have you go first. Oh, nice. That's great. Thank, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, no, actually, so I'm, as a, when I go into a room, I'm very receptive to other people and I'm much more experiencing the room. And so if you were at the heroic public speaking, you had to, to miss out on the first session that we were working in the training mm-hmm. environment. And so you kind of know some people. And then second weekend, this guy appears. And I don't remember the actual moment we met at the actual facility where we were training, but I remember we went to dinner the first night 
Yeah. And there were a few of us sitting around this table and you just came up, sat down and you immediately were warm, friendly, engaging. You were highly interested in not only me, but everybody at the table and diving into their stories, trying to learn little bits and pieces. And you were sharing how much, you know, because of our music connection, you know, with me performing, but you loving music, you know, you're sharing about some of the experiences you were having with music and being up in New York and some of the places where you're going to shows. And so I just found you highly engaging. And as someone, I'm naturally shy and pretty introverted. And in large groups, I really struggle initially to connect with people because it's pretty overwhelming for me. And so when we broke it down in more of a dinner setting versus a smaller group, it allowed me to really be able to open up and connect. And, and you helped me bridge the gap to feel like I really belonged and connected. So I found you really warm and friendly and engaging and just a great conversationalist, which makes it fun for me because I tend to mirror back what I get in a smaller mm-hmm. setting. And so I just really enjoyed that first meeting and really sitting down and hearing about you know New York and Brooklyn and some of the things you had going on and being able to to get to know you. Yeah. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. I remember that first dinner we went to. So, uh, <clears throat> so back to you, I remember, you know, like, like we've clarified a couple times I'm walking in. It's like me walking into school, uh, like a quarter behind. So they give out this group, this other 50 some people that were all there in November and I wasn't there. So I'm walking in and there's this dude in the corner with like, killer leather jacket just looks like a cool dude and I'm like and I think it was Michael who's one of the the owners of the company was like talking about you and how cool you were and I'm just like that's a guy I got to know and not when I and when I found out before we actually met in person we were in the same room together we hadn't spoken that you're like a musician which I'm like an amateur amateur guitar player I know you're like a legit guitar player and a singer and you race cars I'm like I don't know anybody like this guy. I got to get to know this person. Cause you're like a lot of the people in the program and everybody there is amazing, but a lot of people are like coaches, consultants, entrepreneurs. I'm like, there's a dude who's an athlete and a musician and a public speaker. And I remember I was so glad when we got to sit down at that dinner because um, I don't, I didn't know that we were going to, when we were going to connect, but it just so happened that I think it was the six of us set it up at that dinner and had a conversation. I remember you telling me uh, how you are introverted. And I remember at the table you were with, some pretty big extroverts. I think Carol was there. He's also pretty extroverted. And I remember you telling us about um, how you're, you're really attuned to your senses and how like loud noises and lights and things actually affect you, which I don't have. So I thought that was really fascinating to get to know you that way. And then, you know, uh, so my first impression is like, you're, you're, a, you're, like you said, you're quiet when you meet, when you engage, you're like a guy like this guy's amazing. And once you get to know Tyler, he's like a super friendly guy. It's just like the initial engagement is like, it's a little intimidating for somebody like me. I'm in a job. I'm like, I don't care what I do. I'm just like another sales guy. And you're like, I'm racing cars and playing country music. What are you doing? It's like, so for me, it was like, (laughs) and here we are today on my podcast. So how cool is that? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It, it, It is true. And you know, a lot of people, if they don't know what I do, they might just think I'm quiet, maybe even standoffish occasionally. But if they know what I do and then they meet me, that's like, they might either want to jump in immediately start talking because they find it interesting or they're like, I don't know if I want to, like, he's got a lot going on. That's, that's maybe too much for me. But, you know, when I get in smaller groups where it's four to six people, that's where I, you know, if I'm not on stage, that's where I really thrive and show up. So that, that dinner definitely helps me uh, connect because like you said, when you get in a room, there's 50, 60 other people, they're all high performers and you're doing really amazing things out in the world, whether they're coaches, teachers, trainers, authors, people doing a little bit of everything in life and you start going man like i'm i'm just over here like i, I don't even know how to i can't talk to 15 people at a time so <laughs> it's all that's always been a struggle for me since i was a kid mm-hmm. and I, I've, I've worked on it and um but i love you know as a speaker even before going to heroic public speaking being able to add that to training you know you're never done learning and growing and so being in that environment was just the next step and and pushing my speaking to that next level and you know we're doing yeah. more speaking than ever this year in 2020 and you know it's just part of what we do and so yeah it, it was tons of fun meeting you and and continue that relationship over those last year and you know it's one of those things I think when you get in those environments you can learn from people yeah not stay in touch and see where people's careers go and and just keep up 
to see how life is going because you get to see the side of people I think you don't if you're just watching from the outside, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you and I kind of have the opposite experience, or like, and <laughs> the, the the stories that we the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, yeah. right? So for me, it's like I'm like the guy who can walk into a room of sixty people, but like I'm going to meet all of you and I'm going to talk to all of you, and there's no breakthrough for me at all there. The breakthrough for me that I had in world public speaking was that I can be in a room of people like Tyler and everybody there, just like I said, like high achievers, and they actually want to get to know me because the story I had about myself walking in is like I'm boring. Um, you know, I'm like, I work for a company doing a thing I don't really care about. And all these people are out there putting out their magic into the world, whether it be music or speaking or, you know, like running their own business, successful businesses, keynote speakers, authors. So I had a, it sounds like maybe you had a bit of a breakthrough in connecting with people. I had a bit of a breakthrough in like being able to connect with people and realize that everybody's just a person and not having this kind of like, it's not an authority thing, but it's like, I want to be you. So therefore you don't want to spend time with me because I'm not. It's like an I'm not good enough measure up thing. And the cool thing about it is, is, man, I think looking, looking back at, you know, our cohort, cohort HPS seven is like, man, we had some, some amazing people in that room. And we're all just like cool with each other, no matter where we're at and just there to support each other. Huge breakthrough for me. Well, like you said, you learn as much as we tell ourselves what our story is or create meaning around what we think about the way we experience life you know, I look at you and I'm like, man, he has something that I don't and the ability to connect in a way that I find fascinating. And it, it's fun to watch that interaction as you go out and do what you're doing. Cause it's so like, you just wake up and do it. It's as normal to you yeah. as breathing. Right. Yep. So it's just, yep. yeah, the way we look and interact with people. And that's right. I love podcasting because you can get a little more in depth with people and then have those mm-hmm. conversations to maybe learn those little pieces that you might not have heard before. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, speaking of podcasting, let's get into it. I am really excited to have this conversation with you today. So first question for you, Tyler, what is something that you nerd out about? Well, we already hinted at it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, motorsports for me, you know, I love the three things I love in the world are music, motorsports, and people, but really nerding out about is motorsports. I can watch NASCAR all weekend. I can watch IndyCar. I can watch Formula One. I can watch World of Outlaws, USAC, sprint cars and midgets and silver crown cars. I can watch even drag race. I mean, anything with a motor and wheels, MotoGP with motorcycles, I can watch it. I know enough about most of them to have decent conversations about them. And I can get immersed in it to the point where if you don't know anything about motorsports, you're going to be like, this guy is next level insane <laughs> so <laughs> you read my mind because i know nothing about motorsports so that's exactly what i'm thinking like i know moto gp that's motorcycles yep and then i know what a midget car is and i obviously know what nascar like formula one is but and i know what a drag car is but outside of that like i have no idea what you're talking about yeah so you know being able to i mean that's i was became a race fan like first time i went to the nascar race i was 11 years old and I got hooked in that moment. And I'd say probably like mid high school years all the way through today, you know, the cornerstone of that was the NASCAR world. But over time you pick up all the other series and you get to know personalities through the TV and watching through digital and social channels, kind of what they're up to and how they're living and performing. And, and then you get closer to those as you navigate the world of motorsports as a driver myself and, get to have conversations with some of those people up place, you know, one-to-one and, um, you know, it's, it's a family atmosphere. There's a lot of competition mm-hmm. and there's a lot of rivalry, but within that, you know, it's a lot of times you see it in even just a regular business world, but a community of people who love something so much that even in down times, they'll, they'll come in and pick you up. If you, if you have something going on or, you know, the, the world of outlaws specifically as an example, let's say a guy crashes, early on in the race well if the car's not destroyed they'll get the car rolled back to the pits and typically they only roll into town with maybe two or three crew members per team and a Mm -hmm. driver well if you got a lot of damage they don't give you they only give you like two minutes sometimes to replace whatever thing you need to fix you'll see two minutes yeah i mean it's quick like you gotta you gotta bolt on a new shock and you'll see these teams they've already got like a front end setup already put together 
and they can come in if the front end's been bent and mangled up. They can unbolt it in a few, you know, a few bolts, pull it out, stick the other one in there, and bolt everything back up and get it going in two minutes. It's it's incredible to watch, but it only happens because you'll see two or three other teams jump in and assist this competitor to help get them back on the track because you know they're running ninety or something, eighty, ninety something races over a course of ten, eleven months. Yeah. And it's something you you're not going to see the Yankees <laughs> reach out to the Red Sox and be like, "Hey, man, like I just saw it. Like you just had this problem. Let, let me help you while you're in the middle of the game." You can borrow our closer. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, That's you funny. You see that. And so just the way motorsports is, it, it, it's a lot of competition, a lot of rivalry. But uh, at the end of the day, the community knows how hard of a lifestyle it is. Mm-hmm. You're on the road. You're, you're gone a lot. Um, you're in treacherous conditions. I mean, it's, it's a dangerous work environment. And so it's something that I can, you know, I love going into, you know, I race a lot in either the southeast or out west california but when i'm when i'm with my racing friends i love it because you you can kind of talk racing nonstop all day and nobody looks at you sideways because they're like yeah we just get it we live it we breathe it yeah um so i nerd out that's cool if if you can't tell i mean i just went on for like (laughs) an hour talking about just the surface level of some things i'm interested in with racing but it's a it's a special thing yeah i have uh, two quick questions for you on this and then we'll move to the next topic do you have you heard of somebody named Wes buck the name sounds familiar, but I can't place it, so I'm not sure. Yeah, he's a he. So he used to be a drag racer, and now he runs like a drag racing community. And I actually spoke to him. He's a friend of a friend a while back, and I was it's a random business thing, but um, he's got a. I think he's got the leading like drag racing publication. I believe okay. is what he told me. So yeah. yeah, his name is Wes Buck. Look him up. He's a drag racing guy. Uh, second question for you is what What do you race? Like what What types of races? And I guess, is it cars or is it, what, what do you call it? Uh, is it levels of racing? Is it like, what do you actually call it? Like, and how do you yeah, decide I mean, what kind of car, what kind of vehicle is going to race? There's different levels. There's different cars, classes. I mean, there, there's different phrases for classes. all of classes. Classes. Um, that's it. You know, I got my start, you know, when I first was learning about racing, you see the, the cup series on TV with NASCARs, like that's, mm-hmm. that's the big time. And then I learned through reading some magazines, what, you know, how people got, that path like what's what's the road to that world and it seemed that you either go from a asphalt late model into the nascar world or you go from a open wheel sprint car whether it's non-wing or wing into nascar so either one of those paths seemed to lead that way so i was like well i need to do one of those the local track closest to me was an asphalt short track called linear national speedway in brazelton georgia and so it just made sense i was like well i need to start there because it's close to home and that's what I'll do. But I really didn't have any idea how I'd start actually doing it. Um, but to answer the full question, there's like five or six divisions at, say, your, any local track. And typically sure. somebody will start at the bottom and then each year maybe step up to the next division. You might skip a few, but eventually in three, four, five years, you work your way up to the top division. I was the guy who was like, I could start at the bottom, but I've talked to enough people and they say you kind of average out the same at budget by the time you crash. It's not really that much different if you get a used race car. Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, well, that makes sense. Let's just go to the top. And so my first race, I'm in the top division. Uh, it's called a Pro Late model. And it looks similar to what you'd see on TV with NASCAR. It's, you know, it's a different type of chassis and whatnot. But for the casual fan, just picture NASCAR on TV is what we're doing here. Turn and left, asphalt short track. And we showed up and we're running with you know, some drivers who've been going for you know, some are new one or two years, but a lot of them are racing for five, 10. Some of those guys are 15, 20 year veterans. And here I am, wow. some 19 year old kids never raced before. And it was a, it was a steep learning curve. I'll say that, but started yeah. there. And that's primarily what I raced and had a lot of success towards the end of my career in that world. Finishing second, third in points, ended up being able to get hit victory lane, won a couple nice. pole awards for quick time. Um, 23 years old, was ready to make the move up to the next level, uh, kind of like the NASCAR ladder feeder system. Mm -hmm. But we needed six, seven figures to make those deals happen in sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm I'm introverted now, (laughs) and I'm I'm more able to communicate with anybody uh, at a greater level now than ever. I'm not afraid to talk to people, but 
at 23 years old, I was good to do an interview if you talk to me, but trying to network and build relationships in a sales environment where you're trying to network with marketing, chief marketing officers, marketing directors, your regional marketing guys and girls who are out there doing, you know, brand rep stuff. Yeah. And I would just cold call people I'm like, Hey, I'm going to sponsor, you know, I need you to sponsor me kind of stuff. Cause I didn't know what I was doing. I had zero plan, no idea what I was doing. And I was super discouraged because that kind of sponsorship, knowing what I know now, I mean, that can take a year to develop. It might take four or five years to develop oh, that relationship, yeah. depending on what size sponsorship you're trying to sell and produce, procure. And so I did the only thing I knew to do, and that was get out of racing because I didn't have the money to move up and I couldn't justify spending money at the local level we were at to keep going. And so I got out of racing. I was really dejected. Uh, but then in a whim, on a whim, got back into it after six or seven years. And since then, I've been out running dirt and mostly non-wing sprint cars. So cool. they weigh like 1,200 pounds, 1,300 pounds, have six, 700 horsepower. And uh, occasionally I'll jump in a midget and we're, we're working to finalize. You know, we, we haven't locked it in, but you know, we're kicking off 2020 here pretty early in the year. And hopefully we'll have an announcement soon that we'll be running full-time in the, the USAC National Midget Tour. Uh, that's that's our goal for this year we're still finalizing plans so we're hoping to make that happen if it doesn't we'll still be out there racing whatever we can with asphalt and dirt just having fun and, and still yeah. doing, doing the music racing deal and speaking and kind of just being a road warrior <laughs> yeah that's all that's awesome man with the um last question about this i'm i'm fascinated and you're right i feel like i want to talk about it and i know nothing about racing so I'm, I'm loving this what uh what's the top speed that you hit in a sprint car so most of the tracks I've been on are, are shorter versions. So the fastest I've ever been in a non-wing car. So the difference in there's two versions of sprint cars. There's non-wing and there's wing. So a non-wing literally doesn't have any wings on it. It's just the chassis, you know, the, the frame, mm -hmm. you know, engine, wheels, and you go. Yeah. Um, the wing cars have a big wing on top and a big wing or a little wing on the front, and that creates tremendous amounts of downforce. Yep. And so in a non-wing car, the tracks I'm going to, you know, one track, we're probably hitting 70, 75. Another one, you know, the fastest I've probably ever been is probably, I would say, 85. Yeah. Entering a corner, which it doesn't wow. sound, you're like, I, I've been that fast on the highway, no big deal. But when you're <laughs> on a dirt track, when you're sliding the car sideways and you've got a car doing what they call a slide job, where they, they fly past you, dive to the inside, and their momentum carries them up in front of you if they've got enough speed. Um, to do that at that speed, it, it can be treacherous. Yeah. Um, now, can imagine you go to the bigger tracks in the same non-wing car. I mean, they can go to tracks where they're running 120, 130 into a corner. You know, they go to Las Vegas Motor Speedway dirt track, and you know they'll sail it off in the, the 120s. Now you put a wing on the car, and you take these wing cars to Knoxville, Eldora, uh, Paris, out in California, and they might be going. 155 160 plus into a corner running oh wide God. open and barely breathing oh. the throttle and it's like that's next level right there i mean it, the, the non-wing stuff's crazy because the downforce you don't have nearly as much uh, force pushing you into the track and so it, it yeah pretty sketchy and you, they flip a lot um but the wing stuff the speed the hand-eye coordination and the ability to process information that rapidly without being a danger to everyone else because you're yeah. you know you got 20 30 other cars out there um it's, it's just a lot yeah thanks for sharing all that it's fascinating i don't think like 155 miles an hour into a turn that must yeah i can't even imagine i love it the fastest i've ever been on a track is like 175 probably yeah i'm not it was in a test session so it wasn't a, a race but um to do it at speed when you're inches apart from other cars doing the same thing it, it's 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 pretty wild i love it i can imagine that that is quite the adrenaline rush thanks for sharing all that uh so you got five minute five minutes to deliver a speech to the entire world so you gotta i know you're a speaker already so your stage is like a live stage you're speaking at an arena and this is being simulcast around the world tyler what would you give your speech on and why So. Initial topic, and I'd have to run with it. If you're just saying go, yeah, this is it. Time. This is it. You got one. On you. The speech title is beyond the limit. 
And the content within it, it's simply the idea that we only have two things in life that really matter, and that's our beliefs and the actions that follow. And everything we want in life is the byproduct of those two things. And being able to believe that we have a voice, that we matter, that how we, sh- you know, all the things that we interpret as meaningful, uh, whether it's positive or negative meaning, those drive the actions we take. And learning to bump into that wall of our beliefs, bump into the wall of how we experience our actions and going just beyond that limit. You know, like in the race car, for example, in a dirt track, as the night goes on, the groove pushes up and there's a cushion. And mm-hmm. the cushion is kind of, it's the limit. And when you hit the limit, you can go just over it and you can still survive. You can still make it through the turn without bobbling, without hitting the wall, crashing, ending your night. And oftentimes people are afraid to push just beyond the limit because they know what's on the other side of that. It's dangerous. And there's also just that uncertain moment. And so being able to, to hit the limit and go just beyond it, you find a sweet spot of opportunity that's just waiting for us. But because of fear, because of the unknown, we're too afraid to push in and, and go beyond our comfort zones. And I've learned in my life that everything good, good that's come my way has been because I took one step beyond what I knew, what I was certain, and settled into that space of just beyond the limit. And that's where all good things in my life have come from. So yeah, that's beyond cool. the limit, you know, you got you to cool. push your life and, you know, the beliefs and actions. <clears throat> we hold dear, you know, we, we get yeah. easily stuck in routines. And so, yeah, that's, that's yeah. kind of where I'd go with that. that. That's awesome. There's a, there's a, a thing in coaching called the model. And the idea is that circumstances happen and they're neither positive nor negative. And those circumstances create thoughts and create feelings inside of you and your thoughts and feelings. Um, and what you decide to do with that is then becomes your actions and your actions become the outcome of that. So what I'm hearing and what you're saying is something similar, like, you know, your beliefs limiting or not limiting. At the end of the day, it's about your actions. And then like the outcomes that you come from there is, is based on like your beliefs. So I think that's, that's super cool. So <laughs> I'm glad you're bringing up comfort zone. I'm not even going to ask you the first part of this question, because I think going down to track at 155 miles an hour is inside of your comfort zone. That's outside of most everybody else's comfort zone. It's probably other race car drivers. But I am curious because you, this is a good segue. You, you mentioned that all of your growth and the things in your life have come, what I heard there is outside your comfort zone. So Tyler, what's something that's still outside of your comfort zone that might be inside of somebody else's? And, and no fair, uh, and you can't say being in a room with 60 people and having to talk to all of them since <laughs> you, already, you already did that one. <laughs> well, well, that certainly is one. Um, that's probably honestly you know, towards the top of the list for sure still. Yeah, is just having to interact with big groups of people that I don't know. Um, oddly enough, you know, there are certain times in a, in a race car where you maybe have never been to the track, and it's, you know, race car drivers when they're honest, like there are certain tracks that have an intimidating factor to them, mm-hmm. and so, you know, there's still moments in the race car uh, that can be intimidating. I would probably say, you know, and this stems from being a you know childhood. 13 years old, I had one bad performance and it kept me from performing again in public for about 10 years. And then the last 10 years of my life currently has been a reawakening of being in, getting in front of people, speaking, doing music. And so there's still a, you know, even though somebody sees me on stage speaking or singing, they're like, Oh, like he makes it look effortless or easy, or just, he seems like it's natural for him. Mm -hmm. Really? Like that's, one of the, my most uncomfortable moments initially, you know, that first say two and a half minutes when I walk on stage, it's encountering the resistance of you shouldn't be there. This is not good for you. And so for me, I would say still that those first moments on stage before you really settle into the moment, whether it's as a singer or a speaker, that's that moment where I'm like, okay, get over yourself and get out there because you got something to say. Yeah, that's so beautiful. The question for you on that is that you shouldn't be here. Is it that you're not valuable or you're not talented enough? Is is that what's coming up for you in those first couple of moments? So it's a mixture of there's the potential just to fail 
and that connects back to that failed performance as a 13 year old. Mm -hmm. But then there's also that side of like, well, this audience, you know, you might go to a a speaking engagement and they don't know a lot about you. Right. So you kind of have the mindset of like, again, it's that idea of like, get over yourself because your mission is to connect with that audience, even if they don't know a thing about you. And so it's, it's the combination of the fear of failure and do I matter enough that these people are going to care about what I have to say, Mm. but putting those to the, you know, again, it goes back to what do you really believe? And if I believe that to not be a true thing, then I obviously have learned to keep pushing in and going deeper into that discomfort to where it's always less and less every time you do it. But instead of people saying, Oh, you just have to get rid of your fear or you get rid of your performance anxiety. I know of, world-class performers who sell out 10,000 seat arenas who if you listen to them we'll talk about they still have performance anxiety and sometimes as they as their career has gotten bigger it's gotten worse and so for me it's that combination of fear of failure and do I matter enough yeah I read I read somewhere I don't know if this is recent or not that Bruce Springsteen still throws up sometimes before performing like he's like I would I would believe it I mean Uh just because someone appears to be confident or they're this world-class presenter speaker you know dancer you know bruce springsteen like let's say that's his story and that's what happens some people go that's that's not possibly it's there's no way you're making that up but it's you know people who are on stage are just like anyone else they've just learned you know some people have that natural level where it's just like they don't put much practice and they're just that great and then others have to practice a lot but no matter what you know some people can do it and not have any problems but i know a lot of people who they encounter a lot of resistance but they love what they do and they feel like they have something to say and if they don't say it then the world's not getting to experience the best version of them and so they press in and they, they nail it and even when they fail they keep going because they realize that that failure doesn't define who they are Yeah. yeah, I think there's a lesson for all of us in that. No matter no matter what we're up to, that just showing up is a lot of it. And the story we have about ourselves and the performance performance context and all those things, like it's so it's so. I know this is how it is for me. It's so magnified inside of my own head. And then people are like, "Oh man, that speech was so good." And I'm like, "Oh, I thought that was terrible." You're like, "No, that was amazing." And I'm like, "No, tell me the truth." They're like, "No, really, that was really amazing." I would tell you if I whatever. I know that happened to me the other day and I, I had a small speaking thing going on. So I think the lesson for the audience here is for most of us, it seems like it's really magnified inside of our own heads and we actually show up a lot more powerfully and authentic than we even ever gives ourselves credit for. Well, we're always our own worst critic. And I've, you know, say 10 years ago, if you would have thanked me for something I did, give me encouragement, feedback that was positive, I would have, bounced it right off of me and like oh no i just it's no big deal or no you're just you know, you're just making that up whatever and i've learned that even if i don't feel like that was my best or i can nitpick something and say yeah i know i'd mess this up if somebody says hey you did this and it was great or i liked it i try to receive it as much as i can because there's still tension within that a lot of times for me but it's like i want to validate that person's experience because if they enjoyed it they enjoyed it and i'm going to trust that they're being honest that they're not trying yeah. to play me or fix something. And so it's like, Hey, I appreciate that. And just receive that somebody somewhere found value in it and the effort for the, anybody listening, it's if you have trouble taking in feedback, that's positive, you know, it's like learning to receive that. Even if it just feels, you know, a little bit muted early on, eventually you, you kind of realize, Hey, like people are genuine and, they want to see you succeed. Most people mm-hmm. aren't looking for that train wreck moment because it's not fun for anybody. So no. I, I, I like cheering people on. Yeah. So this is, you're bringing up some stuff for me. So something that is outside of my comfort zone is receiving compliments and feedback. Uh, I actually, I like receiving feedback as long as it's negative. Mm. So that's outside my comfort zone is receive that. And I had a friend the other day, actually um, a coaching colleague who reframed this for me and, and gave me a new way to look at it, which I think, this is valuable for me. So I'm going to put it out there into the world. So just what we're speaking about, I'm just going to do it. She said, do you know when you don't accept their feedback 
or compliment and you actually either disagree or blow it off, you're actually disagreeing with them. And you're actually like invalidating their own sense of opinion or so it's almost like saying like, yeah, like Tyler, thanks, but you don't really know what you're talking about. It's actually like in a way, a subconscious insult to somebody who gives you a compliment and not yes. actually just receive it. So I am also somebody who's um, very much practicing a breakthrough for myself and just receiving compliments because it's not, it's not something that comes natural to me. I want you to give me the hard talk and tell me all the ways I suck because I already know I suck in my own head. And it's like, that's actually validation for me, but don't tell me the things I did well, because how am I going to get better? And it's not, it's not really all that healthy. So, no, but the power in that all of a sudden you do validate that person's experience to some degree because you haven't shut them down, shut them down. And eventually maybe it doesn't hit you in the way that they're saying it ever, but at least you begin to find some belief that, man, maybe they do believe that. And if they believe that, then what does that say about me? I must be better than I think I am, or I'm, I'm actually good, or I deserve those opportunities. And it can change everything. And that one I've learned in this season I'm in right now, being in different training groups, mastermind groups, is when you give feedback that sometimes maybe there's some discomfort attached to what you're hearing, but knowing that person has your best interest at heart and you can go back and process, you see that that feedback is the most valuable because now I can use that to not change who I am, but really hone in on, okay, well, maybe I'm not having as much success in that one area because I'm not doing enough of this. Yeah. And again, it's not even like a behavior change as much as it is just the mindset of, oh, like actually other people do want to help me. Like I don't have to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about self-worth and seeing yourself as good as you are and constantly improving, but also being cool where you're at. So I know that's, and as a, as a, I mean, you're like a good example. You're an athlete and an artist. So you have like the double performance thing going on where got to be good on stage, got to play the right chords, got to have hit the right vocal. And in your athletics, you got to be performing there as well. So I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure the pressure you put on yourself is quite high would be my guess. And you're also a very high achieving person. So. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I'm in general, I'm not a very competitive person. Like I know some drivers or just other athletes in the world who, you know, if, if you're playing a card game, they want to destroy you. That's me. You know, <laughs> if, you're, if, if you're playing Scrabble, they want to dominate, if you're, you know, whatever it is, they want to win. And that, you know, from a competitive standpoint, I don't have that at all. I'm, I'm very much outside of racing, non-competitive, but I still want to be the best at what I do. And I want to be the best driver I can be. I want to be the best performer I can be. And not as a comparison to other people, but just knowing like, hey, like if I don't feel like that was my best, then I didn't do my job. So yeah, it's definitely, I mean, you don't want to be a, you know, my ambition, you know, we we're, have released some new music here recently, mm -hmm. a new album called Spotlight. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah, I appreciate it's great. it. Yeah. So we, we've been out doing media and performing and doing a lot to support the, the new music. And, you know, my ambition, you know, by definition, I'm, I'm a country music singing race car driver. But my full ambition, like I want to be driving in the NASCAR truck series and have singles going out to radio on a consistent basis and be touring to support that. You know, the last guy who did that's Marty Robbins back in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s before he passed away. And he, he was a big country music star at the time running, I think he ran like 30, 40 Cup Series races in his life. And so I don't know that I have the opportunity at this point to, to make it to the cup series, but man, if I could be in the truck series racing at that level and, and singing country music at the same time, like that'd be kind of the ultimate ambition. So I, it's absolutely within me that I, I'm a, I'm a high achiever. I want to achieve big things, but more than that, I, I just, I'm a believer that we all have dreams and that it's our duty to bring them to life because you might not like racing. But if you get to know me or you hear my story and then you see me achieve that, it shows you that your dreams are possible. And I can look at somebody else and say, well, they did this and they said they're going to do it. So that means it's possible. And that's when we look at the future of the world in all different ways. And the things that you can be involved in and creating change and innovation and just the, the landscape of opportunity to live a life of meaning. To me, it all starts with dreams. And so I'm, I've always been an ambitious dreamer. And I love, 
you know, I'm curious about others who have that same mindset of like, I want to do something. It seems extraordinary, but why not me? Why not me? I love, that's a great question to ask yourself. Why not me? Well, again, like most people, I think our school system kind of teaches us to almost play small because it's like, Hey, like, here's your path. You have to follow this. You have to do X, Y, and Z. And then we'll check off the box that you've achieved what we think you should achieve. But along the way, nobody's really teaching you how to do business, how to sell, how to connect, how to move things forward. You're just being told what you need to do to accomplish all the time. Yeah. And school, I'm not bashing school. Like school is great. It provides opportunity. But I think we're missing a huge component of teaching kids how to dream and how to actually make things happen out of nothing. How that we mm-hmm. can take an idea, create a plan, implement, see it come to fruition. But then also realize at some point you can't do it all alone. And so we need help. And so then you learn how to collaborate and bring people together. But it does all start with that question. Like, why not me? Like, why does somebody else deserve that? And I don't like, don't play the victim. Yeah. Like take the yeah. ownership to say, you know, like I'm going to do it. And if I fail, you know, this whole music racing deal, I was afraid initially to jump into it. And I finally said, why not me? And if I'm going to do it, I would rather be seen as the guy who went for it and the whole thing looked like a catastrophe at the end because he pushed so hard and he made it so far along that when it finally blew up in his face, he looks ridiculous. (laughs) And then everybody in the world knows that I failed versus being the guy who's like, oh, I just won't do it and turn my back on it. Yeah. Like that's, that's the worst scenario is turning my back on what I feel like is for me. And too many of us in the world, when you talk to people, you know, I wrote a book called I Have a Voice and I wrote it for the 15 year old version of me. But it's been amazing to see how many 55, 65 year old people have read it and go, it reawakened something within me. And again, I go back to the, that question. It made them ask, why not me? Like, why not now? It's not too late. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say the why not me and why not now? That, that one's even better. Why not now, right? Like, why not now? Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll wait till, you know, probably next year's better because they don't have this in order. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm guilty of that, right? Like, it's me I too. Just, I, was, I was sharing with you before in a conversation, you know, I have half of what I need lined up, but then I didn't continue to press in. And I didn't create as much as I wanted in this one area because I just didn't follow through. Well, why didn't I follow through? Because I had this feeling of I can put it off till next year or a few months from now and I'll still make it happen. But what missed opportunities by not asking why not now? Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, you obviously we've covered you do a lot. You do uh, you have the racing. You have the music. You just released an album. It's amazing. You do the the, the speaking. I'd love to hear a little bit about what you speak on, and what kind of audiences you speak to, and what's the you know like what's your. <clears throat> I'm running a I'm running a company, and I want to hire a keynote speaker to come in and get my get my team jazzed up. Why do I hire Tyler? So, a lot of our core programming that we're getting in front of people is, you know, we've designed three keynote topics and say the last two years that we've been focusing on. And they're all based around the idea of raising your potential. And so one of my most popular keynotes right now, and I I mentioned the the five minute talk is beyond the limit. And it's about discovering your performance potential because too many people haven't discovered even a percentage of the fullness of what they have to bring to the table because no one's helped unlock that. They're, they're either waiting for somebody to help them do it or they don't even know that it's possible that they can raise their potential. And so it's a, a leadership talk, it's a motivational talk, and it's really designed for any audience from you know, athletic performance to corporate audience who have maybe metrics where sales matters. So sales organizations or teams where they're working to perform together and there's someone or a group who they know there's more potential within them. They just haven't been able to connect to what that means for them. Mm. And so we use that 
using that talk to, to help raise their performance potential so that, you know, if you have a, a 10,000 person organization and you get 500 people in a ballroom and maybe they're middle of the road performers. Well, we know that the top 10% are driving a huge majority of sales in an organization, right? So what if we can take a group of those middle of the road performers and bump them up into that top percent? What does that do for an organization? Mm-hmm. You're not, not, not even just in a, a bottom dollar sense, making more money, but you know, when you talk about you know, retention and engagement and, and really having people connected, because in this world that we're living in right now, I think for many different reasons, we're more disengaged than ever. And so Beyond the Limits about raising your performance potential A second keynote that I've been giving for a while now is called Living Unapologetically. And it's about shaping the beliefs that affect our life and work. And when we shape the beliefs in a way that work for us, we become unstoppable in our pursuits. And so it's really diving into helping an audience see what's possible rather than what is. So there's a really focused mindset and full clarity on what they want out of life. You know, a lot of times, you know what your expectation is at work but you haven't really examined how that fits into every area of your life. You just might have the mindset, well, my boss thinks I need to do this. And so I guess I do it. But when we help an audience connect to what it means to, to really set your own vision for your life and then put your work into that framework, it changes things. And so you, you end up being more grateful and have more confidence in your decisions and create a life where you're living on purpose. And then we have a little bit more not necessarily a technical talk, but a talk that really is about transforming the way we dream and innovate. And it's called Exploiting Sound, Speed, and Story. Mm. It's all about using sound to awaken our imagination, using speed as a, a radical stimulus required for change, and how we can use story to connect our words and actions to the community around us. Because in today's world, that combination of sound, speed, and story enables us to you know, as a business, create massive opportunity. But at the end of the day, you know, one thing I'm a believer in as a small business owner is the driver of connection and community because you see them and you know them and you interact with them. And so when we can have the opportunity to help corporate groups learn how they can create greater community, you know, how often do you go to a restaurant or a chain or some store that you, there's, you don't know the owner. Mm-hmm. You're not paying attention to who's the CEO or who founded it. You don't know who actually even runs the store that you're in. So you don't know the general manager there. It's basically a faceless experience. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so my talks are, you know, we do a lot of, um, we'll do high school events with athletic programs. We'll do a few full school auditorium environments we'll do uh, university level athletic programs going into talking about performance mindset actions using sound speed and story to, to live unapologetically and then bring that into the corporate audience so it's a little bit across the board but at the end of the day it's for everyone to think about their performance potential love it man that's super cool and i i got a i got a small taste of it when we were in rehearsal group together and i can attest that it's uh yeah tyler's a world-class presenter performer and uh, a guy who's got the entertainment value, but also has the, the expertise and delivers on the message that we're talking about today. So, man, I um, appreciate that. And, and that's something I've been working on is, you know, early on, probably six or seven, my first talk I really gave was 2012 when I intentionally made the move to start speaking. And at the time, I wasn't racing or singing. And I was okay with that. And I was just looking like, okay, I'm just going to speak and really develop that as a career. And I'm going to love it because being able to inspire and, you know, maybe get that one person in the audience to take an action off of something you said, or just pique their interest and maybe thinking differently. I was like, man, I love this opportunity. But then as I got back into music and racing, I saw the power in the belief that the audience has When I say something, the weight of that now, the impact from what I've experienced is dramatically greater because I'm now someone who's actively doing this. I'm taking ideas and thoughts and strategies that I'm employing on the racetrack in a competitive environment, in a high-stakes environment, 
I'm taking things I'm learning in the studio, working with a team, collaborating with songwriters and musicians to bring music to life, encountering resistance on the stage as a performer to give a presentation, to create connection with a, a music audience. And I, the, the power in actively doing that and getting to then share that in real time, I found that it's, you know, for me, the impact has been tenfold. Yeah, um, where I was seven or eight years ago when I was just speaking. So it's it's been an amazing opportunity to to impact people, and that, that's at the end of the day, right? It's music, motorsports, and people. Yeah, it's not, about, it's not about going and well, I spoke at this group or I did this. It's like it's it's people. Like that person's gonna go to another job down the road, and they're gonna bring what they have to the table. I want them to take what maybe I showed them was possible or imparted some idea that they can deploy in their life that maybe they don't even take to the work. Maybe they take it home to their family. You know, it's, these ideas are universal principles that are about life and business happens to, to gain the net positive effect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been talking about all the amazing stuff you're up to the racing, the music the speaking, and I'm sure you have a, Thriving personal life as well, although I'm not sure when you'd fit it in. But we won't get, we won't get into that today. We'll save that for a uh, for another episode. We'll talk about Tyler's personal life um, and all the things you talked about. Yeah, exclusively my personal life. We'll just do a whole. We'll do a Doctor Phil yeah. session, right? <laughs> we'll do a doctor. We'll do it. We'll do a coaching session. We'll have people dial yeah. in and ask Tyler anything. We'll have a. So one of the things I haven't talked about yet, but um, I'm doing a, another version of this podcast. It's going to be the same release cycle. It's going to be called Talking to Cool People After Dark. The difference being <laughs> that we will, uh, I will do it at night, and the the agreement with my guests is we'll have at least two whiskeys, uh, two or three whiskeys, and have a have a more uh, loose conversation, shall we say? So maybe we'll have you back on for one of those here soon. After if dark, I'm, that would that's an appropriate title. <laughs> after dark, exactly. So, question for you about all of that: What's the thing that you're most proud of? At the surface, just as a, a general like theme or idea, I think I'm proud of most proud that I've become I'm in a place where I'm willing to say yes to opportunities that at fifteen years old or twenty years old I would have been terrified. I would have said no way and I wouldn't even considered. And I think I'm most proud that I'm in a place where I'm willing to say yes to opportunities that Oftentimes, even maybe I have fear around because it's such a big opportunity or it maybe is something that's just unknown. And so just being willing to encounter the big, like what's on the other side of that, pushing into it. Because for a long time in my life, I would have been too afraid. So like, that is a, and I guess it's not surface level, that's pretty deep. But as a specific moment, like what, did I, what have I done that I'm the most proud of? You know, I think going back to racing, you know, my, my uncles are mechanics. And so I grew up around cars and, and they did some mud drag racing and I, I did some of that too, but my dad's a dentist. He's a small business owner and he and my mom built, you know, a successful practice in Georgia. And I grew up in that environment and kind of being around the car environment, but nobody really raced cars. Nobody did the NASCAR thing. And so to be able to, on a whim, be like, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to be the next Jeff Gordon and not to let that just be a dream that sat, but to take action on it and to bring it to life. To show up at the racetrack, not knowing a single thing about what I was doing, having less than 100 laps of testing in that race car, having the guy next to us pull up whose son was leading the points championship, ask me questions about where we'd come from, where we'd been racing, and every answer is like, oh, nothing. <laughs> like, literally, man, like, I've, I've never raced before, not just not this track or this division. Like, I'm new, brand new. To go from that and seeing like a wide eyed guy, like fearful of what I'm going to do. To, you know, am I going to put a sun on the wall because I'm an idiot out there? Go from literally no idea what we're doing to um, the proud moment. Like the one specific moment was being able to stand in victory lane with my crew who most have stayed with me the full, it took us about four years to get to victory lane. But to, to know that we beat that night, some drivers that have 15, 20 years experience, track champions, people who are dominating and we ended up in that number one spot 
hoisting the checkered flag and celebrating with my guys. You know, that was, it was as big as for me knowing that my guys got to experience that with me. Yeah. Because it was a group of people who, you know, we knew how to take a car apart, but tuning on it, really knowing the adjustments we were making. I mean, it was ragtag learning along the way, just going up against guys who'd been doing it for so long and maybe their dads got them started in racing. And, you know, this was just me doing it, knowing I wanted it and having a, a group of people who decided to hang around and help out and be a part of it. And so hitting victory lane is that moment in time where I'm like, that was it. Like, yeah, if man. you have an idea and you take enough action and keep working on it, fail, get up, keep working on it. Eventually, you know, I might never have one, but you know, we luckily we did and we can celebrate that. So that's, that's a huge moment. It kind of shows me like yeah. you can do anything if you just decide to. Yeah. It sounds like you had your moment of why not me? Why not now? Yeah, no, it, it definitely was. And, you know, I put that down too early out of fear because I couldn't get that sponsorship. And, mm -hmm. and here we are, you know, reawaken the idea that I can actually still go that far in NASCAR and make it to the truck series. And, you know, is it far fetched? Yeah, to some degree, but, you know, call me one of those insane guys or dumb or, you know, inspiring, however you want to view it. I'm, I'm willing to give it some time to see if we can make it happen. And yeah. if we don't, and man, like, look at all the life I got to live, the interesting people I got to meet. And the way I frame it now is just, it's all opportunity and it's all fun. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm, I'm thinking there too, is the whole, why not me? Why not now? It's likely you're going to have that happen to you multiple times, sometimes around the same thing you're trying to do. Like you just, why not you? Why not now? You did it. You ran into a, something that you weren't willing to pursue. And now you, you came back to your, why not me? Why not now moment? And you took, got after it again. There's nothing wrong with that. So it's not like the moment you declare that forever, that's your thing. You, you know, as human beings, we go through cycles and run into, run into walls, literally, hopefully not in racing, but you know, figuratively. <laughs> I sometimes, probably run into sometimes walls. hitting walls. I've hit a few. Um, yeah. Hitting walls. Yeah. I mean, it, there will be a time when I don't race cars anymore. I just decide that age that it feels right. You know, I'm not married and have kids yet, but hopefully rather soon, like become part of my life. And at some point I'll go, you know what? Like family matters enough. I probably won't race anymore. Or I just decide it's yeah. time to hang up the helmet. And, you know, maybe I'll be one of those guys who is performing and singing until I'm 75 years old, but you know, maybe I'm not a performer on stage forever. Yeah. And so I think having the ability to use the mindset, those two questions are extremely powerful because at some point I'm going to encounter something. You're going to encounter something that there's uncertainty, there's fear, there's unknown. But when I'm willing to say, okay, like I feel like this is something I want. It aligns with my values, my beliefs, you know, it fits with what I'm working towards. Mm -hmm. Why not me? And then knowing like there's never, like I had a bunch of friends at some points and they're like, like, man, like I'm not ready to get married because I need to have my finances in order and this and that. Mm -hmm. and like, but do you really, is, like, is that the reason? <laughs> like, like that makes sense logically, but, and that can get a whole rabbit trail of different stories. But at the end of the day, it's like, why not now? Business, relationships, opportunities. You know, we can always say, well, I'm, there's somebody that's more prepared than I am. Somebody's a better fit. But if you want it, you know, if you want to speak on a stage with 5,000 people in the audience, you know, that might not be your first speech, but I know people who've done that. Mm -hmm. Me too. And they didn't say why, you know, they, they didn't, they just bumped in the question and said, yeah, it's my time. And it's now that there's the opportunity. Like they could have declined it, but man, like what, what doors open because they say yes. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, you know, I learned this in acting training before I went to heroic public speaking, but they highlight this as a, a cornerstone of their beliefs and how they see performance is it's you say yes. And mm -hmm. you say yes. And because one, when you say <clears throat> yes, you, you're going to show up. Yeah. You're going to get that experience. But then when you say, and it's like, but that's not all because there's more to the story that's going to unfold 
And if I said yes, but, or yes, eh, now all of a sudden you're, you're not showing up fully. You're not living with full intention because you have reservations. When you say yes, and like, you know, this is an overused phrase, but like the world is your oyster. Yeah. And you get to create what you want out of that experience by saying yes and like give me more like i'm ready to go where this is going to go i don't know where it's going to go but i'm going where it's going <laughs> yeah that's super cool well, we're going to wrap up here in the next five to ten minutes or so i've got a, a couple more questions for you if you've got some time for us yeah let's do it so man we've talked about a lot of things and you don't seem like a guy with a lot of fear and we've talked about when you have the fear that you you know, kind of, I hear you lean into it and like explore that that's the place for growth for you. So I think this next question is pretty apropos. What's something that you're afraid might actually be true about you? <laughs> Man. Um, I love this question. <laughs> you know, I'm, I could keep it surface level, but. You, uh, you do you, man. I, I don't really do surface level very easy. So my first thought is like, to, are people actually interested in me? Hmm. And you could argue, yeah. well, man, that's, that's why he does all the things he's doing. He's trying to get attention. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, you know, and maybe that stems from being an introvert and sometimes not connecting in bigger groups when you see other people do it so easy. But, you know, going into a place like that environment where you got 50 other high level people, you kind of go, man, like, I wonder if people are actually interested in me. And that's not because people aren't talking to me. It's just you go into that waiting and wondering and then all of a sudden you realize oh people do like people actually do care that's cool um but that's probably my initial answer mm -hmm. to that. yeah i think that's a that's a really good one and i think that's something that's pretty common for people of the there's, there's so much nicety in the world and so much kind of lack of not it's not conflict but people would just want to be I, I think you said earlier you know i kind of go most people are generally good human beings and even when, when, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, uh, you talk to somebody, you're not really that interested, but you also feign interest because it's just the right thing to do and you don't want to make people feel bad. So, yeah. you know, I, I, thinking about what you said, I identify with that sometimes too, where it's like, I got a lot of stuff going on and go, oh, it's so interesting. I want to talk more about it. And I'm like, the, the deep seated thing that hits for me is like, this is really, is like, do you really? Or are you just saying yeah. that because you want to be nice? Exactly. So, well, oh man, well, um, I want, if you could let the audience know where they can find you. So I know you've got a, a ton of presence online in a variety of ways. I will obviously put in uh, all the, all of these into the show notes, but I'd love to hear it from you. Like where we, where the audience can connect with you and find you online. Yeah. If you want to learn a little deeper about some, all the things we're doing, you can go to my website, tylerwilliamslive.com and learn about music, racing, speaking, all the things we're doing there. You can find my music on all digital outlets from Spotify, Apple Music. Uh, you can go to Google Play and Amazon Music, Tidal, pretty much anywhere digital music is found. We should show up there. Uh, so happy to have you guys check out my music and give us some thoughts on, on what your favorite songs are out there. You can uh, connect me, you know, all the socials from Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, uh, pretty much all, everywhere out there. My, my inst Instagram and Twitter are T Williams Live and Facebook is Tyler Williams Live. Uh, but we're out there. We're, you know, starting to write more on medium so we're, we're putting out some more blog content some, oh, cool some original stories and then um i've got a a newly launched podcast called beyond the limit if you can't tell i like this idea of beyond the limit and so um if you're in a podcast you can listen to, to me have conversations with guests who are doing some high performance things and and just kind of learn some behind the scenes on how people got to where they are today and then maybe some ideas behind some of their thoughts on high performance, how they show up in the world, how they maximize their day, the routine to create the life and business or career that they've created. So we're a little bit all over the place, but we're, we're yeah. having fun doing it. Yeah. I, I like that. If you're into podcasts on a podcast, it's a little meta and also a little tongue in cheek. Hey, if you like listening to podcasts while listening to this you, podcast, you, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, definitely true. Well, Tyler, I want to thank you so much for being on today. It's been, uh, it's been great hearing more about your story. I learned a lot about you today and learned a lot about 
uh, how you achieve the things you achieve and the things that you still struggle with as well. Uh, another time on our tradition here to wrap up the show is how if you would leave the audience with some words of wisdom and you've obviously, we've been, we've been dropping, dropping some knowledge and words of wisdom throughout the time we've been spending together, but you know, a couple sentences, what would you like the audience to, if, if you could give them a poster to put on their wall or a post-it note to put on their computer, what would you want them to know? It's not so much what I want them to know as what I want them to think about or do. And that's mm -hmm. to ask themselves, what do I want? Simple as that. I think from my experience, most people don't know what they really want in life. And they're living out of expectations. They're living out of just a routine that they fell into. And so to ask, what do I want my life to look like? What do I want? Do I want more financial freedom? Do I want more connected relationships? Do I want a different job? Do I want, you know, a better relationship with my kids? Like whatever those things are, just start asking, what do I want? And if I don't have that thing that I want, how do I get it? Because can I, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, keep going. Well, no, it's just, that's the foundation. Like if that's the one thing we have, like everything we create is out of that question. What do I want? And so many people get to this place where they want something, but they stop themselves because of all the things that they don't know. But at the end of the day, you don't know until you experience something if it's really for you or if it's really what you even want. Because we can be deceived of what we think we want, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. until you've done it or achieved it or created it, you don't actually know if that's going to be true. And so I'm a believer that if there's something within you that you feel connected to, that you desire, as long as it's not destructive, right? Like we're not talking about going and, you know, diving into dumpsters and, you know, looking for drugs and, you know, becoming an alcoholics and yeah. you know, talking about that kind of stuff. Like what is it that you want out of life that's going to make you better? Yeah. So I'm going to, a wise man once said to me, I'm going to append your statement if I, if I, yeah, Again, my, my show, so I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> what do you want? And if you don't have it, why not me? Why not now? Perfect. Love it. Well, thanks so much, Tyler. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. And uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. It's really inspiring to see you. I, I love seeing the you know, like album release and uh, excited to see the, what you're going to do in the racing world excited to see you on stage someday soon and yeah just keep doing what you're doing it's very inspiring to me and i'm sure it's inspiring to the audience as well jason it's been a pleasure as always and i'm um, just grateful for you thanks man